Hey guys, it's Dr. Rosa. This is another video uh, on wellness that was captured while I was presenting at the Northeast Physician Advisory Board of the Northeast Retac up in Fort Collins a couple months ago. Um, hopefully you guys like it. Uh, it's a little bit truncated at the end because we ran into another meeting and had to stop. Um, and so, uh, so some of those slides get skipped through fairly quickly. Uh, there's a link to the reading list, um, or if you're watching this on a computer, you can still point your phone at the QR codes to get, uh, to get the links as well. I uh, hope you enjoy it, and uh, without further ado, here is the presentation. Excellent. Very good. Well, thanks for letting me uh, present today on this. I really appreciate it. This is a project I've been working on for the last couple of years. Um, and uh, dealing with EMS wellness, um, emergency medicine wellness, uh, burnout in general. And just kind of an informal thing that, uh, you know, if you guys want to sit down with beer and talk about the complete origin story of that, you know, we can talk about kind of how I got into this and, and got thinking about it. But in the interest of time, um, what I'd like to do is just focus on the topics themselves as we go through in, in the talk. And uh, um, if you guys want to have an offline conversation later, uh, my email's on there. Um, and uh, I think my email's also CC'd on probably the, I, I get the, uh, the distribution list for this meeting too, so you guys can probably find my USAC's email on there too. Um, so a little bit, uh, we have to do a couple of the, the housekeeping stuff, so no uh, conflict of interest financial relationships, although I'm quite interested in having those, so if you guys have any, uh, anything where I can make some money and have a conflict, I'm happy to do that. Our learning objectives, I really want to talk about um, the role of leadership in burnout and wellness. Um, identify areas within your role where you could improve your leadership skills to address both, you know, many of the people in the room here who are leaders within the organizations, all the way down to people we have working for us who kind of lead themselves and everybody in between. And um, also talk about how leadership goes beyond your job and is essential for your well-being. This is kind of a focused, uh, a coned down version of um, an overall talk that I've, I've given before that ends up being kind of a two-hour talk and in order to kind of fit that into an hour of I guess 45 minutes that we have right now I just wanted to focus on a single topic on this but really this is um, when you start getting into uh, wellness burnout literature it, it's a rabbit hole there's just so much material out there some of it's uh, very good some of it's very mediocre and some of it's terrible um, and so weeding through that's key and so my goal for this is to go over some things that I found very helpful in this specific topic um, so that uh, if you're interested in this aspect of burnout and wellness that'll save you guys some time you'll have a, a, a decent place to start off with. Uh, basically true false we had to have some questions in here so if, uh, if, if burnout's a leadership problem then is it your boss's fault is sort of the first true false question to think about and then if you're at the bottom of the chain of command in charge of nobody can you still lead um, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go through. So those are kind of the, the simple pretest questions uh, here. So let's talk a little bit about me. So I'm a failed neuroscientist. I was, uh, uh, did neuroscience at Stanford, um, was there for many years, uh, almost got a PhD there, missed it by that much. Um, and uh, basically while I was there, I was uh, volunteering for Bay Area Mountain Rescue, which is a mountain rescue unit, about the same vintage as Rocky Mountain Rescue Group, um, you know, uh, started back in the 70s with a bunch of climbing bums. Um, so I was a unit leader for them, and I got to a point then where I decided I really didn't like my job, but I liked my hobby and tried to figure out how to reverse those. So I ended up going to medical school in 2000, graduated 2008. I did residency down at Maricopa in Phoenix, uh, graduated 2011. I did a fellowship down there in EMS and resuscitation science with Ben Bobro and Dan Spate. Um, and graduated from that in 2012. Came up here to work Good Sam Lutheran and SCL, so I'm a community ER doctor, EMS medical director. Uh, so basically, you know, kind of got this fortune cookie um, that said, uh, you know, maybe I should change careers. So I've also had a little bit of experience having gone through, you know, more or less failing at a career and having to start over again. And so, and that's something that, you know, helped me a lot when I was having some str struggles in, in medicine and, and thinking about, you know, is, am I going through this process again, getting kind of old to go back to school here, is there some stuff that I can do to work on this? The other thing I wanted to bring up, and I mentioned a little bit of this earlier, so this is the I Love Me slide, right? We all have to have one of these. So, you know, I do, what, what do I do? Who, what's my background? Uh, so I do uh, a medical director for U.S. Department of Energy Office Secure Transportation. Those are the guys that move the nukes around the lower 48. Uh, I do work with West Metro SWAT. I'm on board of advisors for SeaTac. 
uh, Foothills Retac. I used to be a federal uh, DMAT uh, doc and deployed. I deployed to Puerto Rico. Um, did a bunch of EMS stuff for USACS, various uh, you know tactical and uh, you know blowing things up, boondoggle type courses and uh, experience on there. And, and one of the things that I tell people is, you know, if I'm the guy coming to talk to you guys about wellness, something's gone horribly, horribly wrong. Like that's, I'm not the touchy feely guy, right? I'm the let's go shoot it and then we'll figure out the, you know, where the tourniquets go after that. So, um, so anyway, one of the things that I really noticed when I started looking into this project is that a lot of the resources that are out there, and this is really relevant for if, if you're trying to implement some kind of uh, wellness stuff in your organization. A lot of the wellness, uh, wellness stuff out there is run by people who don't get what we do. You know, I literally, there was one uh, thing that I saw online. This was at uh, Instant, Institute for Healthcare Improvement, which is a pretty, uh, you know, large and robust uh, process improvement organization in healthcare. And they had this online free training that they did. And one of the guys was on there and he said, you know, when someone's stressed out in the emergency department, I like to go down there and talk to them. And I bring a peacock feather and I have them balance it on their hand. Because if you're focusing on balancing a peacock feather, it's hard to worry about the things in your life. I'm like, I bet I know some guys who could beat you to death with a peacock feather. <laughs> and I know a lot of people who would try. So again, there's a disconnect between some of the organizations and entities that, that, that are, are knowledgeable in this stuff and what we do and what the people who work for us are doing on the ground. And, and, and trying to bridge that disconnect, I think, is really key. So some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about here are things that, you know, when I think about my Department of Energy guys, you know, a bunch of ex-military, uh, you know, trigger pullers who happen to do a little bit of medical stuff on the side, uh, who actually have a pretty high risk of burnout and suicide. We actually lost a guy Thanksgiving a couple of years ago to suicide um, in, the, in the organization. Um, you know, what kind of resources would, would they look at and say, yeah, I think I could incorporate that into my plan? So, so that's sort of the filter and the direction and the, and the specific focus that I want to work on through here. So I'd like to do also a quick review of how I think about burnout um, that covers some of the magnitude of the problem, what it is, how has it happened from my point of view, because I think it's a little bit different than, than how a lot of entities and organizations think about it. And then do, if we get some time, do a decent deep dive into leadership concepts that relate to burnout. Um, there's a reading list. So if you have an iPhone, if you just point the camera at that, it will give you a PDF of the reading list for today. If you have an Android device, you actually need a scanner to make it happen. Um, and then if you want to know how to do this, it's really, really super easy to put these into your talks and it keeps you from having to do printouts ever again. Um, and there'll be, uh, there'll be another link on the bottom. Yeah, it's in Android. It works on Android. Oh, it does? Yeah. It works on Android now. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, Android. And it should be a shared public uh, PDF link. Yeah, isn't that neat? <laughs> I was like, man, I'm so sick of printing out handouts for this thing. And I got to like plan ahead and, and I like to procrastinate. So now I can just throw the, the QR code into there. So anyway, so basically just starting out. So what do I know about crazy? So as an ER doc, you know, certainly mental health and substance abuse, uh, substance use accounts for nearly half the growth in hospital ER volume back in 2016. I don't think in the last four years that's gotten better. Um, and I think all of you guys would, would uh, agree to that. And, and certainly if you're working in the pre-hospital realm, certainly substance abuse is a contributor to a lot of the stuff that we run on. Um, and mental health issues is a contributor to a lot of the stuff we run on. Certainly from a medical standpoint, we have to learn some of the dogma on, uh, on psychiatric stuff. And, and you know, in the longer talks, I like to go over a little bit of the psychiatry and psychology background of this. I'm not going to go through that today. Um, but you know, let's let's take a, just a really quick snapshot here. So this is a, a a quick look at a paper that studied people in the emergency department, and it was a survey. So it has the limitations of that, and and so with 516 total respondents, 60 percent of them experienced depression symptoms. 45 percent of those experiencing depression symptoms had not sought treatment, so they're depressed and they're not getting any help for it. And of those experiencing depression, they had considered harming themselves. Uh, that was about a fifth of those, of these, the 60% that's in here. So this doesn't surprise any of you guys, that, that people in the emergency department would have this kind of breakdown of, of psychiatric issues. I think what would surprise you is that this study, this study, can you dance the slide for me? It's locked up. dialogue box hopped right in front of you. What? Yeah, thank you. I got a Mac I can plug in, you know. There you go. So this was actually a survey of emergency medicine physicians. 
So these are the doctors in the emergency department who are reporting this. And actually, as a plus, you know, those 2016 data I was showing you, we're, you know, in 10 years we've improved because it was 73% had experienced depression symptoms. Almost half of those didn't get any help for it. And half of the people exp experiencing depression had considered hurting themselves. So these are the doctors sitting in the room. So I'll open it up to you guys. What do you guys think about the nurses? Uh, you know, are, are they likely to be de nurses? Are they like to have, uh, be doing better, worse, the same? What would you think? Probably worse. What about our pre-hospital providers? You know, what kind of resources do they have to help with this stuff? A little bit worse. There's one area that's protected, and maybe some people can guess in, in pre-hospital setting. Who's relatively protected from this? <laughs> fire service. Why is the fire service somewhat protected? How do they live? In groups, right? They have a, they have a social structure imposed upon them, a, a, a work family, basically. So they're somewhat protected. They still have problems, but they're doing better than most of the others. So that's one exception. You know, looking at, you know, some more recent stuff. So this is physician burnout by state, actually emergency physician burnout by state. The graph actually starts at 25% and ends at 51%. So here we are in Colorado. We're doing pretty good, you know. Um, Arizona, not so hot. Uh, this is an interesting st uh, statistic I found. Every year it takes two medical school graduating classes to replace the physician who committed suicide in the United States in that year. So every year, two whole medical schools just to replace the guys and women who aren't here at the end of the year. So this is a big problem in medicine. What about EMS? This is a study out of, uh, I believe National Registry did this one as part of people's renewals. They did a, a survey. So again, limitations of survey, but they're comparing EMS provider survey to the CDC national average. They found 37% of those people responding to the survey had contemplated suicide compared to 3.7% of the general population, and 6.6% had actually attempted suicide of the people who had responded to the survey while renewing their licensure for, or, or for renewing their credential for uh, national registry. So this is a huge problem in our providers, uh, a huge problem in our providers. I mean, these numbers are 10 times the, the baseline rate um, in the population. Now, nurses are interesting. So in a, uh, the nurses are interesting because I, I couldn't find a lot of data on that when I looked. So I did a very informal study. I just Googled physician suicide and went to images, which is how I uh, plagiarize all the pictures for all of my talks, as many of you do. Um, and what do you, you get a bunch of like, you know, just general, uh, uh, what am I looking for here? Just stock photo kind of stuff, the sad doctor sitting in the hallway. But when you Google nurse suicide, you end up with pictures of people. And that's different, why? Why well, am I getting stock photos with one, but, he, but like actual people here? This is a massive, massive, massive problem because these are people who are affected by that. And there's some news, you know, news stuff that pops up in here as well in the search. Um, but I think that when we talk about emergency nurses, uh, that's another big, uh, big area to, to focus on. So I don't think this is a physician uh, issue. I think that it's actually worse in the people who we work with and the people you work with and, and basically everyone on the team is, uh, is at risk for, uh, for being affected by this. Now based on that, I want to put out some assumptions here. I don't think that you get into this business unless you're really high functioning and, uh, and resilient. And when you're in the business, toughness is something that we encourage. In, our, in each other when we're working with our friends and our colleagues. Um, and so, so I don't want to basically you know, set this up and say, hey, we're being a bunch of wimps here and we need you know, yoga classes or something to fix this, because I don't think that's true. Yoga is good too, and we'll talk, well, that's actually in a different talk, the mindfulness and yoga talk, we'll talk about that one later. So it is really good. Um, I think just putting on a Tuesday afternoon yoga class probably isn't the solution, um, but yes, it's good. So that's sort of the disconnect, right? It's like, well, yeah, yoga and mindfulness is really good. So uh, here, why don't we just pay for a, a meditation app for you guys and we'll say, we can check the box that we helped wellness this year. So it's the implementation that matters because there is really good stuff out there, but how people implement that's key. But I think that, you know, another upside is imagine these numbers in any other workplace. The place would be a madhouse. So we actually, Despite these numbers and these statistics, we get up, we go to work, we work hard all day, and we're there stepping into the void for other people who need us all the time, and, and we do that. And so I think that there is a lot of inherent resiliency in what we do, and you know, I don't want to be, I don't wanna, you know, be all negative on, on this stuff. I think that there's a problem, I think that there's stuff we can do to address it, but we're also addressing an inherently resilient population of people who actually do have a very hard job and do it well. So, 
let's go through some quick definitions here. What is burnout? If you actually look at the, at the de clinical definition, it's emotional combination of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, reduced personal accomplishment. It's very hard to separate that out from depre clinical depression. The general concept is, well, it's more work-related stressors that, that are contributing to burnout versus you know, other stressors that, are, uh, that are, are, are contributing to depression. But I really think that this definition, it's hard to really take that home. So I want to go over like, how I think about burnout to get an idea if you guys think this is a valid way to, to consider it. By the way, the uh, International Association of Burnout Trainers, they have some check boxes we have to make sure that we get here. So first off, we have to describe what burnout is and then basically tell you what it is you do at work every day. Um, I think we got that one. Uh, it's very bad. We got some scary statistics. Check that box. We good? Make sure you exercise. Exercise is good. Uh, you got to eat less crap because that, that, that crap you're eating, that's really doing that. More sleep. More sleep's going to help. Uh, oh, meditate. We got to meditate too. Yeah, don't get too much sleep, but get enough sleep. Get the right amount of sleep. Um, and yeah, pretty bad. So. How many people have been to a burnout training where that's what they basically cover? And I think we've all been to those, right? And it's kind of like, okay, yeah, um, all right. I think I get three different reactions to that. So I think that some people in the room are just like, this is a bunch of crap. I'm tough. I'm never going to get burned out. I don't know what you guys are whining about. I also think another reaction is I am burned to a crisp. I have no energy to exercise. There is no time in my schedule to sleep more. The only thing I enjoy in life are the beer and the junk food because they are indeed delicious. And meditate, no. And then I think there's the people who are kind of in a transitional state where they can say, you know what, I could see myself getting burned out. What can I do to avoid it? But again, there are limitations here. Where's the time to sleep more? Where's the energy to exercise more? Again, beer and junk food, fantastic. They are quite good. And then what's this thing about meditation, mindfulness stuff? How do I actually apply that? Is that real? Is that something that's going to help me out? And why do I know there's these three different reactions? We've all been there. We've all been there. We've all had all three of those reactions, depending on what day the talk is at, right? We've, we've, we've been through all this. And so I think a lot of these burnout numbers that we're seeing are also a little bit misleading because they look like half the docs are burned out or half the nurses or this many are burned out, this many aren't. I think it's much more in flux. You have people who are really doing well, people who are really doing poorly, and we kind of transition to the other. So I think over time, this actually affects way, way more people than even the scary statistics would show because it's a dynamic process. And then the next question is, you know, like any, any other good pre-hospital talk, what's the protocol, doc? Come on, what's the algorithm? What are we going to do here? So the question is, why is there no burnout cookbook? Why is there no algorithm you get handed when you finish training and say, hey, apply these things and you won't get burned out? And I, hmm? What's that? Everybody's different. But I think there's another problem too, and this is something that we come up with as we're developing protocols in, in organizations like this, is that we really want to look at data. And we want to know how strong of a recommendation can we make and what's the level of quality of evidence that we have. So this is just the printout, this is just the, the graph that comes out every time Heart Association puts out new guidelines. And it goes all the way from the class one strong re uh, recommendation in that if you're not doing this, we're going to take you out behind the dumpsters and put one in your ear all the way down to, yeah, this is a probably a good idea, or meh, decent idea, and well, I mean, probably not hurting anybody, down to, this is really bad for you, and if you are doing it, we're taking you out back behind the dumpsters as well. So that's the strength of the recommendation, but then over here is the quality of evidence based on that. And so level A is basically multiple randomized controlled studies, you know, best evidence we possibly have versus, you know, not so great or maybe just one randomized control study to, well, we've got some good registry studies here. Like this is more of kind of the trauma literature is a lot of this is based on registry, um, retrospective stuff, all the way down to, well, there's some good physiological stuff, all the way down to expert evidence and everything in between. So every recommendation Heart Association puts out will have both how strongly they believe it and how good the evidence is behind that and all the different recommendations. I wanted to go into this one a little bit. So I was on the BLS subcommittee for Heart Association. I got to watch the, I got to watch the sausage being made. And this concept of expert opinion, um, we can actually convene a very similar expert opinion um, uh, exercise right here. So this is, uh, is going to be the 2020 meeting of the National Chili Lovers Association. We're going to take a quick vote here. So uh, who here likes beans in their chili? All right. Who says chili should not have beans? It should just be meat and deliciousness. All right. Well, I'm sorry, guys. This year, the guidelines are going to be that chili should have beans in it. And that's literally the level of evidence that goes behind expert opinion 
for heart association. They go through the room. What are you doing in your shop? What are you doing in your shop? What are you doing? Sounds like most of us are doing this. This sounds reasonable, yeah? Good, that's the recommendations this year. So now, how do the numbers look? So this is out of 2015 guidelines that I pulled this. Uh, if we break it down by level of evidence, and this is what we see. This is for heart association guidelines every, all the way from what should we be teaching bystanders all the way to what are we doing in the ICU uh, post-cardiac arrest or post-STEMI. Uh, post Level of evidence A is 1%, so that's the really solid stuff. Another quarter of it, a little bit more, a third of it is basically, well, there's pretty de decent stuff here. Then there's, well, there's a physiologic study that's really uh, pretty clear, and a quarter of it's just whether or not you like beans in your chili. And that's the heart association guidelines, which I think are the most science-based, evidence-based guidelines we have in what we do. I think we'd all agree with that, and that's how the data breaks down. So going back to the cookbook, how much Good data is there in wellness. It's hard to even get good, ev uh, good expert opinion because even the experts don't really know the right thing to do. We have some general ideas, we're getting more all the time, but the evidence really isn't there, which makes it very, very hard to come up with what it is it that we should be doing. Here's the manual, here's the algorithm. But I think, you know, why should we let that stop us? Let's cook some chili. So let's go over some stuff that I found that I found to be really helpful in this particular area that we have time to talk about today and see what we can get. So based on my not quite expert opinion, although, you know, like I said, coming through a failed, a, a one failed career and, you know, kind of got close to crashing and burning a second time in, a, in another career here. So what's my theory on how you get burned out? And, you know, if you think about how we, how, you know, at the 3,000 foot administrative, 30,000 foot administrative level, how do we think about burnout? We think about these critical incidents, right? But if I told you guys, hey, we got to stop this training right now because a a a, an airplane just crashed into a train outside and set a bunch of houses on fire, what would you guys all want to do? Right? You'd be like, oh, let's get some, right? <laughs> That's why we get into this stuff, are these things. Now, I will say that if you're already on the edge, could a critical incident knock you over the edge? Sure thing. But it's hard for me to believe that the stuff that actually pulls us into the field is actually the stuff that's burning all, you know, 50, 60 percent of these people out. I don't think that theory really works. But, but I think there's a good model here of think about how you get fat. By the way, if you don't think you're fat, go on television and talk about Puerto Rico and then look at the pictures and you'll believe that you're actually way more than you ought to. Um, so I, I weigh about 200 pounds on a good day. I should weigh about a buck 85. So that means I have 15 pounds of useless fat cooking here. We go 3,500 calories a pound, 52,000 calories of extra fat. There are 4,500 calories in a good Thanksgiving dinner, good quality, you know, high-end Thanksgiving dinner. So obviously the reason I'm fat is that I ate uh, 12 too many Thanksgiving dinners. That's why, I'm, that's why I'm overweight. And the cure is, if I could just skip the next 12, I should be down to 185. Now, it just doesn't really make any sense to us, when, even when we say that out loud, because we know that's not really how our bodies work. But who's ever tried to take five bar? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, they're amazing. What are the five layers? It's like peanuts, pretzels, crack. I think there's heroin on the outside. <laughs> they're amazing, right? Now these little suckers are 210 calories each and we buy them like by the bag for Halloween and those aren't being given out to the children that come to the door. Those are for us, right? So it's these little things that accumulate over time that are the reason why at least I have trouble controlling my weight. It's the little things over time that are taking me in the wrong direction. So I don't think that necessarily this is the model that we have for burnout, all these critical incident stress stuff. I think, you know, especially from the pre-hospital setting, you know, how do you feel, or anything, how do you feel when a patient spits on you, right? You got a drunk, they barf all over the back of your ambulance. You got to clean it up 4 o'clock in the morning, it's 10 degrees outside. Pediatric abuse case. Needle stick. Hey, honey, guess what we're not doing the next six months, you know? Um, get in tr everyone has gotten in trouble for some nitnoid administrative thing that you got to deal with. You got a coworker who's difficult. Uh, what about all the other stuff outside of work? Financial, home, relationships, injuries, illness. I think that this stuff accumulating over time is a much bigger problem, a much bigger target, and we don't do a critical incident stress debriefing for any of these things. Um, so I think it's the accumulation of these small things over time, and, and I think there's a lot of stuff we can do to address how these things affect us and how these things affect our other people we work with. So does that seem like a reasonable model to work with? Does that kind of fit what you guys' perception is? 
because I, I think that's a bit of a shift in how we look at the problem. Because if we're looking at the little things accumulating over time, the everyday stuff that's accumulating over time, that's a much more manageable problem than trying to address what do we do after these great big high stress incidents that you know, are gonna knock anybody down. You know, dealing with an active shooter, dealing with uh, you know, uh, a massive accident, you know, seeing lots of bad stuff all at once. So again, what doesn't kill you gives you a lot of unhealthy coping mechanisms and a really dark sense of humor. So I think that definitely fits into what we do. And if we think about how do we cope with this right now, we do have the dark sense of humor. We get the cynicism, the disengagement, the compartmentalization. A lot of us, you know, maybe, maybe enjoying, enjoying the enjoyable stuff too much and, and trying to kind of treat the, treat the pain with stuff we shouldn't. You get exhausted emotionally. You start to depersonalize. You start to think of your patients as their problem rather than as a person. And then, you know, it's really hard to get excited about, you know, working to get promoted, working to advance uh, your technique, working to, uh, you know, contribute and when, you're, when you're feeling this way. And you get all those things. And if you remember, those last three things are the definition that we put up for burnout before. So I think this, you know, I think that brings it back around full circle that I think that's a good model for how we get to this, uh, this kind of a problem that we're seeing. So that covers my model uh, for a brief review of, uh, of burnout. How are we doing on time? We're doing pretty good on time. So let's just talk a little bit about leadership concepts and how that relates to burnout and, and, some, and a little bit of literature that I've had. And there's some good stuff in, the, in that reading list too. And there's some good links as well. Um, so, you know, I think that, uh, you know, I like Darth Vader. I think he's got a really approach, good, good approach to leadership here, right? So, um, you know, we, we all have had this boss, right? Where, you know, that morale will, you know, the, the beatings will continue until morale improves. Um, and it's, you know, you guys are a bunch of whiners and that's why you're having these problems. If we can just weed out the non-hackers, then, then we'll, we'll be able to, uh, you know, everyone's going to be doing better. And I, I think that, that that's potentially problematic. The flip side is if you work for Darth Vader, how likely are you going to be to actually change that management style in any reasonable amount of time? So if you have these leadership problems within your organization, above you in the, in the organization, um, that's something that's, that's going to take some work. It's going to be a long time project. That's going to be the long war. On the other hand, maybe sometimes we are this guy and we aren't noticing it. And maybe we're, being, we're, we're, we're really not um, giving people the leadership uh, that they're looking for out of us. And, and, we're, and we're doing stuff and saying things that maybe isn't, uh, isn't the best for what's going on to solve the problem. Now, there's one thing that's been really cool that I found over this project, and this applies to all the topics and everything else, is we live in the future. We have so many amazing resources out there that 10 years ago or 20 years ago would be difficult to imagine. The first is podcasts. Podcasts are amazing. They let you consume information at the level of reading a good book in found time. So I listened to a podcast on the way up here. I got an hour drive up here. I got an hour's worth of podcasting done while I'm driving. Can't read a book in the car. I could, could try probably not super safe. Um, you can do this while you're uh, you know, out for a run. You can do this other times. So you can actually consume a lot of information um, and learn a lot and improve what, how you're thinking about these things uh, by using these podcasts. And there's a couple of really good podcasts that are out there we'll talk about specific to leadership that I found super helpful. Uh, there's a ton of stuff out on YouTube. So this isn't really so much found time, but there's things like TED Talks where you can go and watch an author talk about their topic for 10 minutes before you buy the book and get halfway through and say, this guy's full of crap, right? So you can actually start screening what podcasts you're going to listen to or what books you're going to listen to. Um, and so I really highly recommend some of these TED Talks that are on there. If someone says, hey, you should take a look at this book. Well, go look at the TED Talk first. See if the author actually resonates with you. Because if you're reading somebody who everybody else likes but doesn't really resonate with you, it's not going to work. You got to find the stuff that what they're saying fits with, fits with what you're ready to hear. You know, certainly there's even just the old school books. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of literature out there. Um, the self-improvement literature has always been a big part of, uh, of, the, of, of new books that are out there. There's a bunch of good stuff. There's a bunch of junk out there. So regular books are good. Uh, audio books are even better. They kind of bring regular books into the realm of podcasts. I actually love Kindle because it lets me highlight and take notes on stuff. So if I'm using reading material, uh, I can actually capture the highlights for when I want to give a presentation on that. Um, so Kindle's really great. You know, on the iPad, your iPads or, or various tablets can run the app. Um, 
the, uh, the actual dedicated Kindle thing's really nice because you don't get text messages, you can't surf the internet on it, it's just straight up a book. Um, but it'll hold, you know, I have like 50 books in my Kindle um, that, uh, that I could read and, and go through at any time. I have probably two or three of them that I'm working on actively. Um, you know, and there's even like on stu online stuff like this master class stuff where you can do paid content and actually go and take a class that burrows down into specific topics that are interesting to you. These are all things you could not do 20 years ago or 10 years ago. And now they're almost free. I mean, even these classes are like super cheap um, compared to going and taking a, a university class. And, and setting aside the time in your busy schedule to do it. So I think this is really, this is really a, a big uh, part of this is that there are so many resources out there that we have access to that we didn't before. And uh, you know, I've heard this basically discussed several times. We're basically in a new Gutenberg revolution for the spoken word. So right now, podcasts, YouTube, audiobooks have made the spoken word essentially as easy to distribute as the written word has been for 200 years, 300 years. And so we're in the middle of that revolution right now. And yeah, there's a whole bunch of stupid cat videos on YouTube too. There's a bunch, the signal to noise ratio isn't great, but there is still an awful lot of signal out there. And if you seek it out, you can find it and find a lot of positivity. All right, so, uh, so let's go through here. I wanted to do a quick leadership drill. So let's just think about, uh, as we move into leadership, just a, a quick topic. So I want you guys to name three of the most dysfunctional people in your organization. In your heads, not out loud. We're videotaping this. There's people online. How long did it take you to f come up with three people? Right? Better yet, we can even do it down. What are each of their biggest problems? Right? That's just, boom. Like, we could think of that immediately. Well, he's got, well, and that, oh, that, oh, wow, that guy, whew. But then, and, and then, could you even, like, think, if you could sit them down and slap them around a little bit, could you actually sort them out? Hey, you got to stop doing this and start doing that. This is a super easy drill, right? So we just solved this problem for three people in our organization. But what are your three worst traits? I thought you were talking about me. <laughs> Yeah. No, you can't cheat off the other guy's test. <laughs> a little bit different. That, you have a great big ego that jumps right in front of that question as soon as it comes up. So it's super easy for us to be critical of the people we work with. We can see their faults. They wear them on their sleeves. They don't hide them well. But there's a lot of stuff that you do that's problematic and that I do that's problematic. And again, if you do identify those, how painful is it to actually sit down and think, well, what is the one thing I could do that would really make that bad trait less of a bad trait? This is a hard, hard question to have. And this is why we get this Darth Vader leadership. Because it's really easy to look at all the people who work for you and know how they're all screwed up. You just see it right there. It's, it's very, very hard to look at yourself and do that. And if someone else comes to you with this wonderful information, that ego jumps right up again, right? Nobody likes feedback. Even the people who say, hey, I really want to hear your feedback. What they really want to hear is how great they are, right? Because even the people asking for feedback, they aren't really asking for feedback. And when you give it to them, they're gonna, they're gonna, it, it's not going to be smooth. There are effective ways to give people feedback. But I think this is a really important drill to start thinking about what are the things that I'm doing that are making the people I work with more prone to all those problems that we had up there. Because there are things that I do as an emergency doctor, as a medical director, um, as a husband, as a father, as a son, that are making more problems rather than making things better. And if you sit down and think about it, you can come up with a lot of those things. And on the flip side, as you start addressing those issues for yourself, rather than nitpicking everyone around you, you'll actually find that you start feeling better because you're actually addressing problems you can solve. Because how easy is it to solve those three dysfunctional people in your organization? No one else has fixed them yet, right? Like, is today the day? Probably not. But if you can start addressing your own problems, you can start taking, it, you can start taking uh, action on these things immediately. You aren't going to fix them immediately. It's going to take some time. Um, but you can start working on them, and that's key. And I think that this is a societal problem we have. And I don't think it's a new societal problem. If you go back and you read, uh, you read literature from, um, you know, from, uh, 
you know, the Roman Empire even, where they're talking about problems that they have socially. Uh, you know, even like there's some, there's some really good books from, uh, you know, samurai era in Japan where they're complaining about, you know, how the kids nowadays are just, you know, they aren't, they aren't, they don't make them like they used to anymore. Um, so this is a, a, a permanent problem that we have, but it's certainly something that's, that's there, is that we have a personal and societal problem where it's easier to focus on other people's issues to draw attention away from our own problems. We have a protest movement that I think is very much based on this, of people who are unhappy with where they are and how they are and what's going on, but it's way easier to just go out there and complain than it is to look inside. And I, and I think that that's something that's really important. Um, so how do we refocus? Uh, and what is the appropriate horizon of where we refocus? So one of the really good leadership books that I have, this was recommended by Ken Rooks, he's a medical director down at Good Sam ED, um, is a, a book called Getting Things Done by a guy named David Allen. Who's familiar with this book? Nobody? It's a great book. Um, so he really just gets into some really effective ways to sort out the tasks that you have in your life, the projects you have in your life, how to structure your calendar, structure your to-do list. Um, but one of the things that he does is when we look at an issue or a problem, even though it's a big complex project, there's really only two things we need to know about that project right now. The first is why is it important? Because if we're looking at this big project and we can't come up with why it's important, then maybe we don't even have to address that issue because it's literally not important. And then the other thing is, even if there's a hundred things that need to happen to get done, all you need to, is, to do is really figure out what is the next, the next individual action you have to do on that project, because you've got to do that one before you do the other 99 anyway. And if you can start focusing on that, it starts to narrow your horizon down. He talks a lot about, you know, what is the overall mission of projects. Uh, and this is sort of a, a nice little graphic that, that kind of lays us out of, you know, you can think about problems at the mission and vision level and the why I'm doing things, all the way down to the next action and everything in here, three to five year goal, one to two year goal, projects, the individual next actions, and you can kind of go in between. And he uses this model as a project management tool. So, uh, so this is something that I use a lot for the different projects that I'm working on, is, uh, is using that structure. and. Um, and also very much focusing on yourself. So he talks about if you have disorganized coworkers, you can actually organize yourself and it becomes easier to interact with them. You don't have to sort out their hash. They can stay disorganized. You can manage the inputs that you need easily or more easily by, by knowing what it is you need, what the next actions you need to manage that. So again, it takes the focus off, I'm in this dysfunctional team, to I could be a better team member. And I think that's really key. Uh, another one that talks about uh, appropriate horizon, a guy named Jordan Peterson. He's a Canadian psychologist, uh, big podcast, uh, a whole bunch of stuff out there, a whole bunch of YouTube presence. He's this guy, his like thing is like, you know, clean up your room uh, is the big deal. And, and he, he, he puts that in context. He's like, you know, if you're out in the world and you see all these problems with the world and you want to go out and fix them and fix Wall Street and fix politics and, and fix all these other things, but like you can't even make your bed, you're working on the wrong horizon here. You gotta focus on what are the things right around you that you can improve first, because then you need to build out from that. So if you're having a leadership problem at work, I think that the context of that is you really gotta sort out your own issues before you can start delving into that. And by sorting out your own issues, you find that a lot of these problems that you perceived before maybe don't look the same way that you did. He talks a, about, a lot about the purpose and the meaning of what you do being key. And he talks a lot about your individual responsibility. So, uh, so he's got some really good stuff. I've got some links in the, uh, links to his podcast and his books. He just had a book that came out about a year ago, maybe six months ago, 12 Rules for Life that goes through this. It's a really good book, best, uh, New York Times bestseller um, to take a look at it. But again, check out his TED Talk. Look at some of the YouTube stuff. See if this guy resonates with you or if you're like, I don't really like this dude. I'll warn you ahead of time, his voice sounds like Kermit the Frog. Fair warning. Um, but if you can get over that, this is actually the, uh, the podcast I'll be listening to on the way home. Another guy, who knows Jocko Willink? This guy's a little more popular. Any Jocko fans? Yeah. Got some Jocko fans here. He just came out with a new book, uh, Leadership Strategy and Tactics. Really excellent book. Just finished that a couple weeks ago. Uh, so his deal is he focuses very much on ownership. And his you know, kind of catchphrase is that everything in your world is in some way your responsibility. Because anytime you find yourself blaming other people for why things are going wrong, that's unhelpful because there's some way that you are contributing to that. He even goes into stuff like, you know, the weather is your fault. <laughs> it's true though, right? If you say, well, hey, you know, what, 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 happened, what happened with this, uh, you know, why, why weren't you on time to work today? 
Well, it was snowing outside. I don't have any control over the snow. But what do you have control over? Get up earlier because you could see that it was snowing today. Having a contingency plan for the weather is your responsibility. So even these things that it's like really objectively hard to imagine how that's your fault, there's some component of that that you can take ownership of and that you could improve how you do that that could mitigate that to a certain extent. And that mindset change to just always be looking for what are the things that I'm doing that are making this problem worse, even if the problem has a lot to do with somebody else, you'll find five or ten things that you could get working on right now that could probably even solve the problem or at least significantly mitigate it without having to be capable of changing the weather. Um, and so, so he's got some really good stuff. Uh, I got a bunch of his books on there. He has Extreme Ownership came out a few years ago. Uh, Dichotomy Leadership came out about two years ago. He's got a really great podcast. He actually, number 98, if you, like to, if you really like the cask strength wellness, um, try out podcast 98 where, or, where uh, Jocko and Jordan Peterson uh, talk. It starts off pretty dark. Um, they go through and you know, talk about the evil in the world and talk about a uh, ISIS sex slave uh, report. Uh, from the New York Times. So it starts out pretty dark, but they very much go into these topics. And it's a nice, like I said, maybe not the place to start with these guys, but if you, if you really want to jump in feet first, uh, Jocko 98 is the way to go. Um, and then I think it comes down to also thinking about who is a leader. So this is the fully activated instant command organization chart, right? From our ICs, we got the general staff down here, all the way down to the single resources. So who on here is a leader? All of them are. How is a single resource a leader? Leading that. Huh? Leading that. It's leading that, knowing your job, knowing what you're supposed to be doing, knowing how to interface with your boss up, up as you go up the chain of command, knowing how not to interface with your boss going up the chain of command, right? So all these people in, in an organization have a leadership role. And actually, you know, it's not unreasonable to flip this all the way over and say, really, you know, the incident commander is there to serve everybody else on this. And, you know, the upside down organization chart is a different concept that we can think of. And so really, you know, we've all been to incidents that have deployed some chunk of this where the incident commander is, I'm the guy in charge, I know what we're doing, I know what everyone's doing, I know all your jobs, and I'm going to tell each one of you how to do that. How's that always, how does that work out? Yeah, it's always an epic disaster, right? But the leader who gets up there and says, hey, you guys all know what you need to do. I'm going to give you some general guidance. I'm going to empower some people to come up with plans for us. I need to know if we're going in the right direction or the wrong direction. I need to know what you guys are seeing on the ground that's going to help us, uh, help us achieve this mission. And so, so really, everyone on this organization chart is both a leader and a follower. And, and really, followership is probably a better word for some of the things we could do to be a better leader is how am I interacting with my boss that I'm actually making my boss's job harder? Um, how, how am I making people above me in the chain of command not effectively able to help get the mission done? And there's a lot of stuff that we can do to cover that, and a lot of stuff in, the, in, the, you know, in these books and podcasts that can help that. So how can a leader affect wellness? Let's go straight down to that. Well, I'll tell you a little uh, spoiler alert. It's not by paying for uh, you know, a meditation app or having the Tuesday afternoon yoga class of which, not bad ideas, but there has to be a process here. Um, you, know, uh, you know, free gym memberships, that's another way. Hey, let's get everyone gym memberships. Because exercise is good. If we buy people gym memberships, they'll exercise. And if they don't, it's their problem, right? That's kind of the other side of some of these, proje these projects, right? We've provided this stuff for you from an organizational standpoint. You didn't really take advantage of it, so this is now your problem. So there's a, there's a bit of a double-edged sword here that we have to watch out for. Or, you know, we, this is like the, the running joke on the nurse, the nurse meme stuff on, on, on social media, right? It's a bad shift. We're understaffed. Here's your pizza party for the, for the yeah, no, that doesn't happen. No, that's not real, right? And so these things are, I think, well-intentioned. But I think that this is where, if you are at that decision-making level in your organization, you got to think about how you're implementing this stuff. How are you helping people actually take advantage of, of what they need to take advantage of? And, and really, um, I think that another chunk of the literature that's very helpful in this, we got about four or five minutes left. Another chunk is this uh, flow literature. Who's, who's read up on any of the, the psychology literature on flow? Is anyone? 
I'm much here. So this is really good. So this is written by a guy whose name I can't spell or pronounce. Uh, oh, Mihaly, ah, I can't say it. I'll, I'll, I'll bet on the next page here. He's a Hungarian uh, psychi psychologist who uh, basically looked at, he was one of the big founders of the positive psychology movement. So psychology is like, kind of like medicine always has been of these are all the diseases that you have and these are how you fix these diseases. So there was a movement kind of in the 70s and 80s to say, well, there has to be a psychology of wellness of when you're actually doing well and happy. And so he basically would set people up with little pagers that would go off and notebooks throughout the day. And anytime they'd go off, he'd have them write down what they were doing and how they felt and some other stuff on this little questionnaire. And by looking at people across cultures, across different, different parts of the world, different specialties, different socioeconomic status, he found this interesting pattern. He also found that there's this thing called flow. And flow is uh, another way to think about it, so being in the zone. And this is a universal human thing that every, when you explain it to them, everyone's like, oh yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's when you're interacting in some activity and it is so engrossing that you lose track of time, you aren't worrying about the past, you aren't thinking too far into the future, you're, you're thinking just in real time as each part of the challenge comes up in front of you. I think in emergency medicine, this is when you have a really sick patient and you're just crushing it and you're just doing everything, one procedure, one step after the other, and you're knocking it out. I think skiing, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you have a good ski run, I think that's another example of that. Being in the zone. And it's what it is, is it's where you're in a high challenge environment that you have high skill and capability in and that they're matched. And as you shift the challenge level, you end up in these other quadrants of this, uh, of, this, of this graph. So for example, if you have somebody who's not very good at what they do and they're not very challenged, they just get very apathetic. And if you say, well, we just got to challenge them more, they get worried or they get anxious because they don't have the skills to adapt to it. Vice versa, if I have someone who's in a low, in a, uh, you know, low challenge, low skill environment, I just make them better at it, then they end up kind of moving into boredom and not really where they want to go. So this idea of matching the challenge level to the skill level as someone grows and keeping them in this is key. So this is important both for uh, you as an individual because this is where people are most happy, is when you're in this zone. Um, and some people spend about 40% of their time in that area. Um, and, there's, and they're called autotelic personalities. The, the, this guy goes into it in greater depth in the books if you read that. Um, but there are strategies that you, can, that you can basically put in that help you get there. And I think as a leader, one of your goals should be to try to figure out how it is you can keep the people in your team in flow as much as possible is a good approach. Because if I'm matching their task to their skill level appropriately and I'm letting them be undistracted and do this, they're going to be happy and extremely productive. And if there's ways we can keep them in flow more, we should, that, that should be helpful. Vice versa, what do you think micromanagement does to flow? Hey, you got that thing done yet? Hey, you got that thing done yet? Well, hey, you did it this way. I think you should do this other way. There's this other way I think you should do it, right? That's breaking people out of flow, which they enjoy. So, so finding a way to have that in your team is very key. And so he has a good book. This is the one, he's got multiple. The one of uh, psychology of engagement with everyday life. By the way, here's his name. Yeah, that's why I can't say it. Um, good luck spelling it. Um, but anyway, if you look up uh, uh, a flow psychology, you'll be able to find that. He's got a great TED Talk on this as well. Uh, it's about a 20-minute TED Talk. The link's there. It's in the reading list as well. And like I said, this Everyday Flow book is a really good one because it covers kind of the everyday stuff that we do um, and how to get in flow. But again, present in the moment without distraction, which gets to the meditation and, and yoga issue we were talking about before. This is, this is a, psycholo a psychological uh, uh, view on that, that concept of being present in the moment. You get very hyper-focused, your OODA loop's short, people love it. And like I said, this is a universal concept. Everyone across the world has, has something where if you talk to them, they'll tell you what, what kind of stuff gets them into flow. So I think this is a really useful thing. Um, this is what I talked about already. So there's ways you can, there are ways you can optimize this with your team. Are uh, the things you do in the preventing it? Um, imposition of ego, distractions, mismatching people to their roles. Either giving them a job that's way too easy or giving them a job that's way too challenging. Um, unhelpful criticism also tends to. Uh, this is the press gainy issue, right? Where hey, you know, this Tuesday afternoon, here's an email of all the patients who think you suck. Like, not really super helpful. Here's another good one. This guy's a, he was a professor when I was at Stanford, um, and uh, Robert Sapolsky's his name. And he studied uh, baboons in Africa. 
and he would go and look at these baboon troops, which are these really highly socially structured organizations, which uh, you know every baboon knows exactly where they fit in the social hierarchy, 100%. And he went in and they checked stress hormone levels, they checked cortisol levels in the glucocorticoid levels in these in these baboons. And who do you think has the most stress? The guy who's got to be in charge of an entire group of baboons, or the dude who's hiding in the corner and isn't responsible for anything is at the bottom of the hierarchy. Who has a more stressful position? The bottom. The people at the bottom of the hierarchy, or the baboons at the bottom of the hierarchy, have much higher glucocorticoid levels than the person who's in charge. So the other issue is by allowing your team members to be in charge in a way that fits their skills and fits their abilities, you're actually reducing their stress, even though you're kind of giving them more responsibility. It's a little bit counterintuitive. Um, and so something to think about here. And uh, if you're thinking about the fact that you as the leader, even though leaders feel very stressed all the time because we're responsible for our teams, you got to remember that your teams are feeling stress in a different way and suffering from it more and having a lot of the downstream effects of increased glucocorticoid levels over time, which we know is bad. Um, so again, thinking back to these different issues with goals, skills, planning, so if, how does your own personal lack of organization affect your team? If you're disorganized and you're not answering emails, um, you're not, you're not uh, tracking tasks very well, you're not managing project, projects very well, how does that affect your team? How do you structure communications with your team? Are you micromanaging? Are you giving unhelpful criticism? Um, and then how do you keep track of your own tasks and, and what you're expecting from your team? And again. Um, We've got getting things done. So how many emails are in your inbox right now? Who has greater than 100 emails in their inbox? Who has greater than 1,000 emails in their inbox? Who is not going to raise their hand no matter what number I say because they know the number's too big? get over 2,000. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, so one of the cool things that he has is, uh, is, a, is a good strategy and algorithm to how to empty out your inbox. I run at zero. I have zero emails in my inbox. There's probably like 10 in there just since we started the talk. Um, but he has a really nice algorithm for it um, and a lot of stuff on project planning. One of the cool things he has is this two-minute rule. So this idea is if someone hands you something that, that needs to get done and you can complete it in two minutes, you should do it right now because it'll take you more than two minutes to file it away, find it again, and then do it whenever. So when I go through my inbox, so I had like probably, I think when I first did this, I had about 2,000 emails in my inbox whole bunch of you know time bombs and dragons living in there um, but you go through first and foremost like 75 percent of it's just straight up garbage right so that's whoosh, gone 1500 emails trash a good chunk of them are reference emails this is information i may need to look up later i just need to find a system to file that a whole bunch of them are two minute rule things where all i need to do is just reply to the email and say yeah no i, no, I can't do that thing or yes i can you know i'm available on the 13th some of these things are projects and to have a prod using your inbox as a project planning tool is a failure drill. And so, so really, how do you move those things out? And having an algorithm way to approach it, you know, every morning I get up, I sit down, I look at my email, I run through it, I do the two-minute ones right away. I have the projects that, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll turn the project ones into projects or, or add them to ongoing projects, delete the trash, file away the reference, go back down to zero. It, it's so, such a relief to know that anything in your inbox is really only a couple hours old. So if there is some disaster in there you don't want to deal with, it's only a couple hours old. It can wait till Thursday, right? Make it to do on Thursday. I'm going to deal with this thing, file it away. I'm not going to deal with it now. But when you find those things six days later, when your boss wanted an answer five days ago, that's problematic. And those things will, those things will, will rot your brain. Oh, this is the algorithm, by the way. Um, so you, know, you got your two minute rules, you got your uh, trash, Re reference stuff, we have a project management, uh, two minute rule, just do it, and then otherwise delegate it or, or make a task or, a or schedule when you're gonna do this thing. This is a life altering little algorithm. Again, great book. But do, I'm gonna go ahead and skip through. So there's a good, uh, you'll see a link to self-authoring suite, which is a, um, it's a kind of a big picture, big horizon life organization tool um, that lets you kind of come up with a good three to five year plan. Um, I didn't get a chance to talk about Brene Brown. Um, she's someone who doesn't resonate with me very well, but a lot of people I've talked to find her, her stuff to be really good. I don't think she's bad, she just doesn't, doesn't quite fit my personality. She has a really good leadership book that I wanna read. I've read these other, these other books, they're, they're pretty decent. But again, these resonate with some people, not with others. She's got a great TED Talk um, and, and just a different view of exactly the same topics. And I think really, you know, we could think about this as, I, I should start this talk with this slide, but it's a little harsh. You can put this up like people just 
you know, they're not interested in this. But I think that if you're feeling burned out, this is really your problem. This is something that you need to deal with. But it's awesome because if it's your problem, you can fix it. So really I think you can fix it is key and burn on your team is your problem. And you can also fix that. I think that if you look at the things that you, that you can change and fix and help with yourself, that you, there'll, be a, there'll be a follow on effect. You start reading about this stuff, getting interested in this stuff, your team members will start wanting to talk to you about it. And this'll, this will help them help themselves as well. So there's, a, there's definitely a feed forward thing. This is a cool little thing too that talks about the feed forward and leadership. This is a little thing off, uh, I think it was off Facebook. It may not even be true, but if it's not, it's still a great story. So um, a few years back, I was having a conversation with an Army psychologist. I asked him what I could do to help the guys I used to work with. He told me about a command sergeant major, so top of the enlisted uh, hierarchy in the, in, the, in the Army, and he scheduled an appointment for Friday at 10 o'clock. The command sergeant major came in, talked to the therapist about nothing in particular for his allotted hour, and left. Scheduled another appointment for the next, same time next Friday. Showed up again, talked about fishing, baseball, whatever came to mind. The following week went to the same way. At the end of the appointment, the doctor asked the CSM if there's any mental health issues you want to talk about. He said, no, I'm just fine, but there are a thousand other soldiers that know I come here every Friday and I want them to know it's okay to go get help. So by talking about these issues, you actually are empowering the people looking to you as a leader to know that they're not alone in this stuff. And this is something that they can actually, they can actually um, ask for help with, talk about and think about, because there is a certain taboo around this topic. And so I think that's, that's something we need to keep in mind as well, is how are we leading, as leaders, are we leading by example? Are we open about the struggles that we're having, the solutions we're finding, you know, thinking through the problems and not just siloing that stuff? Um, so is your team, hmm? We got people oh, signing in. Signing in? All right, let me we'll jump off. It starts at 2 o'clock and there's people online probably waiting to get there. All right, let's skip on through. Do, 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 do. Bunch more leadership uh, stuff in the handout. Sorry we didn't have time for all this. Some fitness stuff. Uh, if you want to look at some good exercise, uh, exercise is good for you. It's a good way to get into that. I think we got the goals. Code Green campaign is a good resource. Foundation 1023, this is a Colorado-based resource. It's good. Arizona DHS, the EMS office. Uh, ben Bobro put together some really good, or well, well, Ben Bobro is in charge. They, the, the team put together some really good stuff out there. All these are good resources to use. Obviously, let me know. Um, and we'll skip through. Got a website. If you guys want to take a look at that. Does anyone need a new view, a second view of the reading list? Oh. All right, cool. Let's wrap it up then. Thank you guys. Thank you. Well, thanks for watching that all the way till the end. Um, sorry again about having to skip over the last few slides there. Uh, but hopefully the, the material that did get covered was beneficial for you. Uh, go ahead and reach out to me on uh, either social media or my email if you have any feedback or comments or questions. Let me know if there's other topics you want me to cover. And uh, be safe out there. And, and uh, thanks again for taking the time to take a look at this uh, training.